we just want to welcome you here to King of Kings community in Jerusalem from uh, all over the world. We thank you for being here, for connecting from over 30 countries. We thank you for those of you watching on Facebook Live and King's Community Live and YouTube as well. Hey, make sure you share this with your friends. Ask them to like it and to share it and to pass it along. Listen, we know that there's a lot of congregations around the world right now who, who can't meet together, and perhaps that their congregation doesn't have uh, the resources right now to do a strong live stream or a, a strong recorded message and worship service. If you know that's them, please, listen, we don't want to take the place of their home congregation, but while they can't get into the house of the Lord, maybe share it with them and let them connect with the wonderful time of worship right here from King of Kings in Jerusalem. We wanted to make sure that you got a chance to connect with Pastor Vako and Ula as well. So thank you guys for sending us that message from Finland. Um, and the reason we wanted you to see that was because you get to see the other elders and pastors quite regularly. Whether it's myself or uh, Pastor Mike, Pastor Ray, even Pastor Wayne uh, is able to come up here and, and lead us in the Lord's Supper or, or speak from time to time as well. But Pastor Vako and Ula have been stuck in Finland for a number of months and and they felt a little, a little distant, a little disconnected. We didn't want them to feel that way. Uh, Ula was able to be back with us in the land a few weeks ago. And we've got some great discipleship classes coming up in the fall that Pastor Veka was going to help us to teach. So thank you guys for sending the greeting from Finland. We hope everyone around the world uh, uh, sends their love. So send them a note on Facebook or YouTube or something. Make sure they know that we miss them and we love them. Listen, let's dive into the Word of God tonight. Turn with me. Go ahead and get ahead of me to the book of James chapter 1. The book of James chapter 1. And for those of you that may be watching tonight, from other parts of the Middle East. Uh, a lot of us understand what happened in Beirut this week. We want, to, want you to know that we've been praying for you uh, in our prayer ministry and prayer tower. We've been covering you guys in prayer, all the believers there. This is a great time to shine as a witness in a very dark and desperate time in Beirut. Uh, not easy, already dealing with an economic crisis prior to COVID, and now the coronavirus hit, and now this explosion. Uh, Lord, have mercy on the people of Beirut, and may they come to know the one true Messiah in Yeshua. Hallelujah. Last week, we started a brand new series called Faith and Faithfulness, and it was really the introduction to the series on the book of James, and tonight, we're going to dive headfirst into the book of James, and we're going to do it in what I call an exegetical style. It's a little bit different than when we do topical subject matter, and we study from a topic, and we draw in all of the relevant scriptures from all over the Bible to give us that balanced approach of theology on a topic. But when we study the exegetical passages, it means that we're going to look at a book of the Bible, and we're going to read it verse by verse. We're going to unpack what God has for us in those verses and, and do our best to apply it to our life. And so we're going to do that tonight as we continue in faith and faithfulness from the book of James. So turn in your Bible to the book of James, chapter 1. As you're turning there, I will recap a few key phrases from last week's sermon that you can catch on the archives. One of the things we said last week was the prerequisite of faith is God speaking. See, you can't have faith until God speaks. You can't make up the thing you want to have faith in. God has to speak first. You have to believe his words. You have to act on his words, and then it becomes faith. The prerequisite to faith is God speaking. The second thing we said as a key phrase last week was, real faith is shown by the action that one takes in response to God's promise. You see, you can't just hear God's promise. You have to do something about God's promise. It's not enough to believe it in your head. you got to do something. There has to be an action item once God speaks into your life. He doesn't tell you what to do without the expectation of you doing it. He doesn't tell you what to do without empowering us to do the thing he's asked us to do. And so a key phrase last week, real faith is shown by the action that one takes in response to God's promises. Now let me tell you a little bit about our friend James, the author of the book. Of course, anytime you study a book of the Bible, it's very important that you understand the author, the audience, and the intent of the author. And we're going to cover all of those tonight. But the, the James that we're talking about, Yaakov, would have been his Hebrew name, Jacob. James is a brother of Yeshua, meaning they shared uh, parents on earth. 
Of course, Yeshua was born of the Holy Spirit, and a seed was planted into Miriam's womb. It was a miraculous birth. It was foretold by the prophets. And yet James, his brother, is born of natural causes, from Yosef and Miriam, from Joseph and Mary. Now, we know a lot about the family, maybe more than you think we know when you put all those scriptures together. A little bit of a background on the family as we get started. In the book of Mark, chapter 6, verse 2 and 3, we learn this about his family. It says, when the Sabbath came, Yeshua began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that he has been given? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Miriam's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So what did we learn about his family? Well, we already knew that Yeshua was a carpenter, so some of his brothers probably went into the carpentry business following the footsteps of, of Yosef, the father. But we know that he had at least four brothers and at least two sisters. They don't name the sisters here, but it does use the plural form of sisters. Not just one sister, but sisters. So Yeshua's in a big family. Did you ever think of that? Very Jewish thing to be born into a family that's growing, growing, and actually to have a large Jewish family. So that with the four brothers and the two sisters plus Yeshua, we know that in Yeshua's family they had at least seven children. That's a full house. Seven children. You know, in the King of Kings family, one of our, one of our campus pastors of one of the Hebrew-speaking congregations, a native Israeli, Hebrew-speaking, and, 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 and when I had my fourth baby, he was congratulating me on having the fourth baby. Now, this, this pastor has seven children. But when I had my fourth child, he hugged me and he said, congratulations, that's not a bad start. The fourth child was a good start to the Israelis, having seven children. And Yeshua's family had seven children. And the people around them took offense. Isn't that funny? Where, where does he get this wisdom how does he know all of these things? And instead of saying, that's, that's remarkable that he knows these things, they, they're offended at him. How dare you know these things? What a strange thing to be offended at, someone's wisdom. I'm offended at your wisdom. That's just such a strange concept. James and the other brothers did not believe in Yeshua. I want to make this point. They did not believe in Yeshua as the Messiah when they were growing up. They didn't even believe in him as they were adults. They didn't even believe in him. Some of them didn't even believe when he was in his earthly ministry. They still didn't believe that he was the Messiah. It wasn't until later in Yeshua's ministry, and in some cases, after the resurrection, that they started to believe that their brother could be the Messiah. And I'm sure they had lots of family issues to deal with. I know with my four children, we have all kind of competition issues. Now, I like healthy competition. It makes people sharp, makes them better, makes them work hard. But can you imagine the competition they had in Yeshua's household when Yeshua's the oldest brother? You see, when, when you already have older brother versus younger brother, there's already a complex thing going on there. Already a little competitive nature. But can you, can you imagine being the younger brothers and trying to outdo God? Trying to outdo Yeshua. You know, they're out there playing basketball or they're kicking the soccer ball around and Yeshua wins every time. And it's got to be frustrating to the competitive nature of the other brothers. And then he, he aces every test because he knows all things. His parents are always using Yeshua as the example. Well, James, you know, if you would have done it like Yeshua, it would have worked out. He probably grew up with a little bit of distance, with a little bit of resentment to Yeshua. After all, the perfect example was always out in front of him. It's hard to feel like you're getting the affection and the approval of the parents when your older brother is God himself. And so James grows up not believing in him, doesn't want any part of it, separates himself from the Messiah that way. In the book of John chapter seven, we get a little bit more about the family dynamic. John seven, verse two through five. But when the Jewish festival of tabernacles was near, Yeshua's brothers said to him, leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. 
Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world, for even his own brothers did not believe in him. You see, I didn't make that up. His brothers didn't believe in him. His brothers are watching the miracles, watching the teachings, and not believing. Can you imagine? And it says, even his own brothers did not believe in him. This picks up again in Mark chapter 3, verse 20. Then Yeshua entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. There were so many people. And when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he is out of his mind. You want to know what his family thought of him? During his ministry, as so many thousands of people started following Yeshua, watching the miracles, listening to the teachings, what wisdom, what authority, no one ever speaks like this. This is amazing. Feeding the thousands. The, the houses are filled no matter where he goes, no matter what town or what city. He enters a house. The house fills up. You can't even get the sick people in there to be healed because there's so many people. We learned that from many stories. And when his parents show up and his, and his brothers show up and his family gets there, they're not in awe of what he's doing. They try to take him out of the way. They try to get him out of the limelight. They, they try to make sure that people aren't following this strange character because their viewpoint of Yeshua is he's out of his mind. How'd you like to come home to a Shabbat dinner to that? You have a long history of this competitive nature in the family. You have other siblings who are battling against you, who don't believe in you, and they actually think you're out of your mind as you sit down for the Shabbat meal. They probably ask him all kind of strange questions. Hey, Yeshua, who did you deceive this week? What crazy teaching did you do? Who did you trick into thinking you healed them this week? For even his own brothers did not believe in him. They thought he was out of his mind. And it was after the resurrection that his brothers start to make a turn on heart. As a matter of fact, the, as a matter of fact, James, James has a private moment with Yeshua. Now remember, James is the next one in line. And James has a private moment with Yeshua after the resurrection, before the ascension, where I think it all changed for James. His heart apparently was already in motion but in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we learn this. This is after Yeshua showed himself to hundreds and hundreds of people and did miracles. It says, after that, Yeshua appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and the sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. And then he appeared to James, and then to all the apostles. You, you see, that's a very interesting verse because he doesn't appear to the apostles in collective form until he appears to James first in a private moment. James is not part of the apostles. Remember, he doesn't believe in him. He thinks he's crazy. He's out of his mind. Hasn't been a follower. Has even rebuked Yeshua, taunted Yeshua. But now he's finally come to his senses. His heart is open. Yeshua knows it. And before Yeshua goes to the full circle of the apostles... He stops and has a private moment with James. Listen, if you're watching tonight and you're not so sure about God and you're not so sure about Yeshua, who he is, and if he cares about you, if you'll open your heart to him tonight, he'll stop and have a private moment with you. Just like he did to his own brother who didn't believe in him. Yeshua wants to have these private moments with us. After this private moment, do you know what happens to James? James. James is discipled, and he becomes the leading pastor of the Jerusalem congregation. That's, that's a great note of progress in his life. He's discipled. He grows. Now, now it all starts to make sense. The prophecies, the Torah, the, the teachings of Messiah, his brother, he puts down the competitive wall. He puts down the distance and the friction and all the jealousy, and he opens his heart and in that private moment, you can see Yeshua coming to him and saying, James, I love you. I've always loved you. I've always believed in you. Now, here's what you're going to do for the kingdom of God. You're, you're going to lead the Jerusalem congregation. 
And James becomes the senior pastor of the Jerusalem congregation. And later, by the time you get to Acts chapter 15, James has become the, the preeminent leader of the council of apostles and elders. So he's not just pastoring one congregation anymore. He's sending out other pastors to go plant and other elders, and he's training them. And when they don't know what to do, when there's a discrepancy in theology and doctrine, they come back to Jerusalem. They sit around the table for this council. They all give their opinion. They quote the scriptures. They pray under the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's James who stands up and gives the final ruling. Nothing moves forward in Acts 15 and 22 without James giving his own ruling first. That's where he's risen to, this brother who didn't believe in Yeshua, the one who thought he was out of his mind. So throughout this book, remember who we're dealing with, this author. We're dealing with an author who had to go a full circle. He had a long journey throughout his life before he finally yielded to the truth of the Messiah. And with that introduction of James, the author, now let's go to James 1, verse 1, and look at the audience. It says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Yeshua. Can you imagine finally writing that? The brother you refused to believe in, now you're going to write it. In your first verse, you're going to start it off. I'm a servant of God, and I'm a servant of Yeshua, who on earth was in my family as my brother. A full yieldedness, a full submission and humility. I'm a servant of Yeshua the Messiah, and I'm writing to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings, he says. Why is that verse important? Well, for several reasons, but one of them is this. Notice that he writes to all 12 tribes. James doesn't consider that the tribes are lost. Can I just say it to all of us around the world? Many of our Jewish brothers and sisters watching around the world. The tribes are not lost. God never lost them. He didn't, he didn't have to go hunt them down. God didn't hire a private investigator to go find them. They were never lost. They were scattered. There's a difference. Scattered because of discipline, out of love that God had for them so they could get their head on straight, call on him, and return to their homeland. They were never lost. They were scattered He's addressing Israel as a corporate unit, and that corporate unit has 12 tribes. They're connected tribes. He's not just addressing Judah, as it has come later into some people's thinking that the Jews of today are only from the tribe of Judah because of the word play. No. Jews today are the descendants of Jacob. Back in Exodus 19, he writes to all of the sons of Jacob. That means all the tribes. And then we fast forward to the New Testament. James himself writes to all 12 tribes, just like we find in Exodus. The Jews have come home, and they're going to continue to come home from all over the world where they're scattered, not lost, in all tribes, not just the tribe of Judah. As a matter of fact, this is even underscored a little bit by the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, chapter 11, when he describes himself. In verse 1, Paul says, I ask then... Did God reject his people, Israel? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham. I am from the tribe of Benjamin. He doesn't say I'm from the tribe of Judah. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. That means there's another apostle embracing all 12 tribes. So this is the audience. James is the author. The audience are the Jewish people, the Jewish believers from all tribes no matter where they are on the earth. Now, what is the intent? That's author, audience, and now we want to talk about intent. So as we begin to read the opening chapter here, chapter one, this pastor apostle James is feeling the necessity to prepare his congregation and those listening to his letter for the trials and hardships that will be coming. Notice that James does not take a position that the believers will always be protected from cultural events or governmental problems or natural disasters. He doesn't take that position that they would always be protected from them, that, like the believers would never experience hardship. He doesn't take that position. As a matter of fact, 
James guarantees you will have tough times. He guarantees that your faith will be tested. If we continue in the main text, James chapter one, look at verse two and three. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Trials, testing, they're promised. They produce perseverance. And notice it wasn't, hey, you're gonna face a trial. No, trials, plural. It doesn't say, hey, one day you might face something difficult. No, it says, many trials of many kinds. That means your life is gonna be peppered with trials and testing, and they're gonna be hard. They're gonna be many different kinds. So as soon as you, why would he say many kinds? Because he wants you to know that as soon as you conquer one trial, God may not try you in that area next time. He's gonna try you in a different area. Why? Because it stretches you, it grows you, it tests your faith, and it produces perseverance. You say, oh man, that doesn't sound like good news at all. Well, God has the long game in mind, not the short one. And he knows that if he's built you to rule and reign with him and for him over his creation, that you need to be prepared in your character, in your faith, and in your perseverance. God is in the long haul. He's, he's, he's looking at the long game here, the long destiny and vision, not just this little temporary vapor of the earth. He's looking at eternity and what we are going to grow up to be. And in order for us to grow up to be that, we need trials and testing of faith and perseverance. Let me give you our first key phrase tonight. Maturity is shown when both perseverance and joy are displayed at the same time. Woo. You know what, on social media, you're not gonna get a lot of likes on that one. You're not getting a whole lot of thumbs up and shares. and not, No, you're not gonna get that. Why? Because that's a tough message that maturity is shown when both perseverance and joy are displayed at the same time. You know, it's one thing to persevere through trial and, and to have a bad attitude about it the whole time. It's another thing to have joy when life is going well. But what about having joy in the trial, in the testing, when you're having to have perseverance? What about that moment? That moment is called maturity. Perseverance and joy at the same time. Because that's what the verse said, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face many trials of many kinds, that that's the testing of your faith that produces perseverance. Look at the next two verses, verse four and five. Let perseverance finish its work. You see, in James's mind, trials, testing, and perseverance, they're doing something. They're, they're working on something. They're, they're gonna produce something. So he says, listen, don't abort the process. Don't stop it in the middle. Let perseverance do its work. Let it finish its work. So that why? So that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. You say, well, what would I be lacking? Keep reading. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. You know, in our community group this week, and you know that we are a congregation built on the strength of our small groups, our community groups. They're still meeting online. We need you to connect with one. Even for those of you that may not live in Israel, you can connect with some of our small groups who are meeting online. And in this week's community group, we dealt with that verse exclusively. We said, what does it mean? If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. How can God not find fault? We're sinners. And of course, our conclusion was, yes, but when God looks at us, he sees the blood of Messiah over us. He sees the purity of the robe. He sees the name of Yeshua. He sees righteousness that's been proclaimed on us. That's why God doesn't find fault, according to James. But what are you lacking? You're lacking wisdom. So in order for the work to be finished, listen to me, the, the, the goal is not perfection. How do I know that? Well, because we still live in a sinful world. We still have temptation. We still have sinful tendencies. God knows that perfection is not gonna be had in this world, in this body. 
But what you can have is maturity. What you can have is wholeness, completeness, the shalom part of the word of God. What you can have is wisdom. Let perseverance, perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And if you lack wisdom, ask God who's going to give it to you. Ask wisdom. Wisdom is the finished work. Now, one of the concepts you have to grab here are the connecting words. If you lack anything, and then it says, if you let perseverance do its work, you will not lack anything. Next sentence, and if you lack something, so it's telling you the answer. Well, what would I, what would I be missing? Well, what you'd be missing is wisdom. Well, how do I get it? You ask God, and God gives it generously. And when, when does he give it? He gives it in times of trial. He gives it in times of testing, in times of perseverance. That's when he gives the wisdom you need. This is the preparation that James is talking about for his congregation. We are to pursue joy in times of needed perseverance. And in these hard times, these hardships, we should be asking God for wisdom and for help. You see, the previous verse tells us what we're supposed to be asking for. If any of you lacks wisdom, ask God for wisdom. That's what you're asking God for. And friends, listen to me. During this extended time of the COVID-19 and this extended time of economic downturn, and hardships, and people losing their jobs, and professions, and money, and houses, and it's all going. God is saying, when you don't know what to do, when you're having to persevere, find joy, but even when you don't know what to do, when you lack wisdom, ask me. I will tell you what to do. I will never leave you alone. Look at verse six, he picks it up here. But when you ask, so he's expecting you to ask, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. If you're not sure what to do, you can't find peace, you don't have security, you don't know the future, you're seeking wisdom, you ask God for this. But understand that when you ask God for an answer and you ask God what to do and you ask God for wisdom and when he gives you the answer, it needs to be met with action. You act on the word of the Lord. Remember the prerequisite to faith is having the Lord speak. And true faith is tested by the action that you do when God speaks. But lacking faith and allowing doubt only brings insecurity and fear. And it blocks us from receiving the things that we actually need from God. What are the things we need? We need wisdom. We need clarity. And the sad part is when we let doubt creep in, when we don't allow faith to show itself in action, the Lord says right here, when you let doubt rule you, don't expect to receive anything from me. Wow. Pastor Chad, I thought you said that God is a God who wants to act on our behalf. He wants to answer. Well, he does. But he knows that the fertile ground of him speaking and you acting is faith. And if you let doubt creep in, he says, I can't, that's not soil I can use. I can give you the seed. I can give it to you, but it's not soil that it will grow in. So don't expect it to grow anything. Don't expect to receive anything from me if you're not going to believe in the things I'm telling you. We're like, God, well, I'm having trouble, so why don't you just do everything, God? Why don't you just tell me what you're going to do, and then you do it? And God says, well, that's not how faith works. Faith works by you asking me, and I give you the answer, and then you believe it in your heart, and then you do it. That's how faith actually works. But if you don't plan on believing me and you don't plan on doing it, don't expect anything from me. 
And now you understand why so many people feel like they haven't heard from God. It's not that God isn't speaking. It's that they're not acting, and then they're blaming God for something not working. You know, I've got children. We talk about the children a lot of times, and, and my kids love to use toys for purposes that the toys were not intended to be used. There was a little, there was a little bus, like a little school bus, and it sings songs, and it's supposed to teach my youngest one who's two years old to learn her letters and sounds. You're supposed to press it, and here comes the sounds. And she's sitting on it like it's a motorcycle. And it's only about this big. And she's screaming at it. She's beating it. She's kicking it. She throws it across the room. She's so mad at it. And she's learned enough words to tell me with the stomping of her foot, I'm so angry. Two years old. And I said, what are you so angry at? I'm angry at that bus. Why are you angry at the bus? Because I can't ride it. I said, well, you know the... You're not supposed to ride that bus. It's not like the big bus. It's meant to be touched, not ridden like a motorcycle. And that's a great example of what happens in the world. People, they either don't ask God, or when they do ask God, they don't listen to what the thing is supposed to be used for. And then they try to use it for something else. It doesn't work, and then they blame God that it didn't work. And God says, but if you didn't do what I told you to do, don't expect to receive anything from me. You got to use it for why it was given. And this is what the book of James is going to be all about. Faith in action. And he's setting us up with these verses. He's getting us ready to make sure that we get it, that faith must be in action. Now, many of us hear the word trial and we think persecution and certainly persecution can be part of a trial but in the 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 final verses that i want to look at tonight verse 9 through 12 of james 1 this text seems to have a different topic in mind let me read it to you verse 9 through 12 with all that we've learned so far tonight listen to what it says talking about trials and testing perseverance and faith faith and action do what i say or don't expect to receive anything all of those lessons Verse 9, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossom fails and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Uh Uh-oh. Where's Pastor Chad going with this one? What's he gonna say about it? Well, first of all, he's not talking about the rich person passing away, in a sense. He's not talking about the rich person dying. He's talking about the rich person passing away because the rich person might no longer be a rich person. You understand? That's what he means by it's fading away. The riches are fading away, not the rich person himself. But the verses here speak of plants withering, blossoms failing, beauty destroyed. He's talking about a rich person's business, their livelihood, their money, their wealth, the things that they stored up for themselves. And the blessing mentioned is for the believer who perseveres with joy under the trial of, catch this, under what trial? Not persecution. It's the trial of losing everything you have. I hope you caught that verse. That verse was not about persecution. It doesn't say people are beating you and attacking you and putting you in jail. Those verses are talking about trials and testing producing perseverance Asking God for wisdom, having joy in the face of trial, and what is the trial being described uh, as? The trial being described is losing everything, not persecution. That lesson right there, my friends, ought to change somebody's theology tonight. That God not only promises trial, he never promises you will always keep your riches. Now, 
Just to be fair and to be balanced in the word of God, we know that God's heart is that of a good father. He wants to give good gifts to his children, but he never promises that you'll have them forever. And you don't put your love of God in place because of what he gives you. God wants to bless his children. Listen, I'll, get, I'll read you a few verses just for balance. Proverbs 28, a faithful person will be richly blessed, but one eager to get rich will not go unpunished. Paul, talking about tithing and giving to the poor, writes this in 2 Corinthians 9. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Verse 11 of the same chapter. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Friends, there's going to be times in our lives when we have abundance. And there's going to be times like right now when we don't. And if your theology of God has been built on the fact that you can only have a blessed life, then you're going to miss this lesson right here. You say, no, no, no. I can only believe in God. I can only have faith in God. I can only put my trust in God when things are good. Then you've missed the book of James. You've missed the lesson tonight about trials, testing, and perseverance. There'll be times you have abundance, but I'm here to tell you there's going to be times you don't have so much. The history of the patriarchs were filled with both. While Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were all blessed and very rich, we also have Job and Joseph who were blessed at times, and at other times they went through great trials and completely poor. The apostles always had their needs met, but they never seemed to have much surplus. Right? Paul kept making tents long after he was famous. In today's economy, with the coronavirus, watching things around the world, the riots, the tragedy in Beirut, it should show you, friends, that believers are not immune from the impact of national and global events. And if your theology has been built on being immune from it, then you've missed what the Bible is telling us. Because somebody has to go into the dark places to bring light. And it's hard for the people in darkness to understand your message if you don't understand where they're at. There's a harvest field that needs your story, your story of success, your story out of beauty from ashes, your story of what God delivered you from. What doesn't sell very well when you're preaching the gospel is to tell somebody that's desperate, I'm so sorry you're desperate, I've never been desperate. That story doesn't sell. That's why Yeshua, when he was preaching the gospel all over the nation, what would he do? He would first heal the sick and feed the hungry. Be with them where they're at. Understand how desperate they are and how hard their life is. Don't be like them, but understand where they're at. And sometimes you understand better when you're there yourself, and God knows that. Now, we have an opportunity to walk through these trials with great joy, growing in perseverance, because we know perseverance completes the work of maturity in us. Romans chapter 8. Who shall separate us from the love of the Messiah? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. See, that didn't meet somebody's theology right there. We face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, angels or demons, the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Messiah Yeshua our Lord. Listen to me. This very famous verse has two sides. When we are going through trials, when we are going through testing, it doesn't separate us from God's love. He will never stop loving us. But the other side of the coin is what we're going after tonight. When you're going through hardships and trials and all of the testing, that should never separate you from God's love either. You see, God's love being poured out from us, from him to us never stops, and our love 
for him should never stop. It's a different way to flip it. It's a different way to see it from the author's perspective. It's not only talking about nothing can separate God from giving his love to us. He's also challenging us that no trial should separate our love going to God. Because love has to be in agreement. That's what we're looking for, that love relationship. Think about that perspective. Talk about that in your small groups. We know God's love will never be taken away true. But in this context, we know that tough times are coming. Sometimes they should even be expected. And did you hear the verse, our key phrase tonight, number two? Be more than conquerors. Well, in order to be more than a conqueror, there must be something to conquer. Has to be something to conquer. And here, trials, testing, perseverance, wisdom. Let me close. God is a good father who wants to bless his children. There's no doubt. But he also understands that the trials test our faith. They produce perseverance. And they finish the work, which is maturity in us. And when we lack wisdom on what to do during a time like right now, during a trial, we're supposed to ask God. And while we do appreciate the physical blessings that God gives us, we do not use these physical blessings as our measuring stick on how much he loves us. Nor should these trials shake our love for him. I'll close by repeating verse 12. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. And notice, again, the example here wasn't persecution. It was perseverance under the trial, under the test of losing riches and losing everything you have. And I'm hoping that tonight when we look at love and faith in action, when we're looking at trials, testing, perseverance, maturity, and wisdom, we're looking at faith having action behind it, that we never measure God's love for us by how much physical blessing he gives us. We thank him for it. We appreciate it. And I'm going to tell you one thing. If you put your trust in those riches and those riches fade away one day, your faith is going to be on very shaky ground. But if your faith in God has nothing to do with your position in life and the riches you have or don't have, your love and faith of God will, will never be shaken. So be careful to what you're listening to. Be careful for the theology you're putting your trust in. God wants to bless you, but he never promises you'll always have riches. He never promises you that you'll never have a tough time because he's preparing you for something bigger than just this little world. Amen. Don't forget that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the goodness of your word. We thank you for the boldness sometimes that's needed to preach the fullness of the gospel. Not every word is easy to hear. But we receive your message today. And we come boldly. We ask for that wisdom that you told us to ask for. Father, what do we do right now when we've lost our job? What do we do when money is almost gone? What do we do when our families are losing their apartments and their houses? What do we do? God, would you give us wisdom so that we can move with an action on that wisdom? And we thank you, Lord, for the perseverance you're building in us. It's got to be frustrating to Satan because he's running out of weapons. He's running out of lies. He's running out of deceptions when the people of God love God and trust him no matter what's in front of them. And thank you, Lord, for getting us to that place of maturity. We bless our people here in Jerusalem, all over Israel and the world with that word in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. 